And then um, <coughs> you have some older stars as the material coalesces, you have the form formation of stars, and basically cooking the primordial um, elements into some of the heavier ones. Uh, cooking, uh, running along with the theme of the cauldrons of the cosmos, uh, which is a pretty famous uh, nuclear astrophysics early test. So um, processing all the early materials to make some of the lighter elements, but all the way to about um, iron or so, and you can see sort of abundances uh, that are from observational measurements that you see things all the way to approximately around iron or so. But that's where we run out of making things in stars, which is basically cannot make some of the heavier things. But this represents our present universe, and basically this is our present history of all of the abundances of the elements that we see today. It's called the solar abundances. So this uh, fairly well represents what we have today, and we know that this is what you make in stars. So the big question is, where do the rest of these materials come from? And that's a... Um, the topic that has been the core of nuclear astrophysics for more than 50 years, I would say. This is a diagram uh, which is uh, modified from a paper by Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Coyle. They basically looked at the abundances of the elements and assigned processes uh, using the rudimentary nuclear physics that was known at the time. They already made this, uh, assumptions that some of the very light nuclei would be made in stars through burning of hydrogen, helium, carbon, and nitrogen, and oxygen, and so on, and up to silicon or so. But then the heavier elements, they uh, surmised would have to be made in uh, either some neutron-rich uh, environment that where you produce neutrons and the uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen burning cycles. So uh, they, they coined the phrases of slow neutron capture and rapid neutron capture to, to try and get to making all the heavier elements beyond iron. So why do we, um, to just say, um, do something a little bit about the slow and the rapid neutron capture process. The slow process, fairly well, uh, both processes, slow and rapid neutron capture, both involve neutron capture and beta decay. In the slow side, you stay closer to stability, so you basically uh, stick to the line of stability fairly close, and for the rapid, you get out fairly far away, so you have successive neutron captures and you can get away from stability. So the scenarios in which both of these occur would have to be very different. Uh, in a case where you have enough neutrons to make this happen, but here um, sort of surmised to be fairly explosive kind of scenarios that can make that happen. So let's put the processes on the chart of nuclides. Uh, there's only three of them shown here, and this is the rapid proton capture process. And the S process you see fairly uh, close to stability, and the R process <coughs> fairly far away from stability. And uh, basically for the RP process, that's a process that occurs where you have accretion of high density material, proton rich material, but it's still a charged particle reaction, so it's a proton capture or alpha capture, which just means it runs out of steam uh, right at uh, C equals 50. So above that, you don't make any more, or you do make them, but it's just the reverse reaction is just as likely. Things don't happen. That's where the RP process ends. What about the S and the R? Uh, the S continues along here, and the R uh, is estimated to be here. So what is uh, the importance <coughs> of all this is that um, the R process is beyond the limits of where nuclear science, uh, the knowledge in nuclear science. So if we want to, it coincides well with trying to understand 
the origin of these heavy elements with uh, studying nuclei that are very far away from stability, some which can be made in some of the future facilities we're building and others which cannot be. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties about it, but in terms of the question of where is the site that you make these heavier elements heavier than iron, it ended up on a uh, U.S. Science Academy's 11 uh, latest unanswered questions in physics, astronomy, and astrophysics in the beginning of the century. This report was uh, released in 2002, and you can see the questions that they picked. So is Einstein's idea of gravity correct? Uh, what is dark energy? And so on. And one of those questions is, how were elements uh, of <coughs> iron made, and basically where, how and where? This is a popular magazine that had picked up the story. It's more effective to show this than I think the Science Academy report. Um, I love their title for the story um, for, for that question. So what's, what are the challenges? Well. As astronomical observations have improved tremendously, uh, people have been making more and more precise measurements. And now there, there are many measurements. This is atomic number C, so you can see there are measurements all the way to the actinides. These are from astronomical observations, so uranium and thorium and so on. So there are lots of precise measurements, and you can see the whole distribution. <coughs> across the board. Well, astrophysicists on the other side have no problem to come up with scenarios that might be the site for the art process. Um, as astrophysicists in general don't worry about a few orders of magnitude disagreement with data. Uh, we nuclear physicists sort of tend to do that. And fundamental symmetries people worry about it even more than uh, in the nuclear structure people. Like the 100 kV type thing is not bad, Stuart. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> what's missing is knowledge of the nuclear physics for some of these nuclei that we don't know anything about in the laboratory. So understanding what these nuclear properties are we'll be able to narrow down this list of potential sites for something like the R process to happen. Um, some popular ones are neutron star mergers, um, supernovae, neutrino <coughs> winds of supernovae, and so on. In any case, it's clear that you cannot make a rapid neutron capture process <coughs> in a sort of stationary kind of scenario test to be some fairly violent explosive scenario. Okay, so that's the problem. How do we solve it? Um, this diagram is another chart of nuclides within very light gray, um, indicates some broad band of our process nuclei. Uh, whenever I mention this topic to do students, they always say, why is there a band? Why is it so wide? Well, those are the uncertainties. We don't really know where things are exactly, and where that band is depends a lot on nuclear physics, nuclear mass models, and a lot of the properties that go into that. This figure here shows the relationship between um, some different mass models and what you would get for the abundances of the elements for the solar distribution. So that's what's shown here. Um, the black line is the solar abundance distribution, and we have two mass models here, um, purple and red. I don't know if people can tell those color differences. <laughs> I don't mean to be staring. So. Okay, so if you, depending on what mod, mass model you use to try to simulate this such a process, you get very different distributions for um, the solar elemental distribution. So what is indicated here are these, uh, for example, these regions around close shells, Z equals 50, and Z equals 82. And the fact 
much that some of these red things are very far away from being measured by any means. So what we set out to do was to try to simulate the R process. There are lots of uncertainties. So people disagree about what kinds of R processes there are. People disagree about mass models. So there's a lot of different things that are uncertain, but um, trying to determine which nuclei do you go after first. So some of this yellow and green areas are color indications of nuclei which might be measurable soon, as in some of the facilities that are just coming online or have been online. And uh, the sort of redder lines are future facilities and maybe we'll get there and maybe we won't. So how did we uh, make a setup of what we measured? We started with uh, a model for the R process by Brad Meyer, was uh, modified slightly by Rebecca Sermon. And um, we adopted a mass model. In this particular one, we used the molar um, FRDM model. We said, what happens if you simulate the R process with a specific seed? So when we were in search of, when you're an experimentalist, someone gives you a, a chart of all the R process nuclei that are interesting to measure, you'd like to know which ones are going to have the biggest impact. So initially we ran such a simulation, starting here with iron uh, 70 seed. We watched it sort of process through, and initial observations, and uh, what I say is you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know this, but we saw that there was this sort of buildup of material right here. This is a no-brainer. It's sort of a, a closed shell around nickel, so a doubly closed shell nuclei. So that's where we made our first attempt was to, uh, to try and measure some of the nuclei in this region. And also that was at the edge of what was accessible um, at the time. So, Annie, yes. can I ask you one question? Sure. On your previous transparency, you were also mentioning that there's more than just the masses that are of relevance of, and, the, and the model. There's things like deformation. And how do you, do you put those into the uh, analysis? We did that in a separate attempt, but here we have not taken that into account. So what we're using is the FRDM, which has implicit deformations okay, right. in certain areas. Sure. The input for the simulation um, Includes <coughs> neutron capillaries, so those are relevant, and beta decay rates, um, and masses, so separation energies. So we couldn't handle all of them, so um, the sensitivity study that I'll talk about a bit later has to do with trying to work with the separation energies part, so one of the three bits that you could work. But this was initially, um, we took a look at sort of what are the first experiments we want to try. And uh, we decided on nickel 78. You've probably heard um, results of this measurement. It was published in 2005. So this was the first uh, measurement of nickel 78. In the last five years, there have been many um, other measurements in the region and <coughs> improving, but the limit of knowledge is really at nickel 78. Uh, what's shown here in orange is the R process path, so everything to the left of it would be the nuclei that fall along the R process path. So things like nickel 78, there were 11 events here observed. This is five years ago. Uh, this is still a bit of a challenge uh, to, to do further measurements on nickel 78 in terms of structure, but this allowed us to measure the half-life. Um, you can see here, this is uh, nickel 76, that's nickel 78, and the measured half-lives were um, a factor of 10 shorter than any uh, predictions for these nuclei. So at the time, we took a simple calculation.
calculation. Again, what I'm showing you in blue here is the observed solar abundances and um, taking on the half-lives for all of these nuclei from, again, Peter Muller. Um, and that's the sort of distribution in green that you would get. This is a completely theoretical predictions for the half-lives of nuclei that haven't been measured. And then adding to it the new measurement of nickel 78. <coughs> and that's, that's what you can see. So it has some effect with just this one measurement over thousands of nuclei. So our, we're trying to develop an experimental program, again, not to do sort of uh, try to measure every one you can get your hands on, but try to determine which ones are the most impactful, which ones are going to make the most difference to uh, the VR process. We went back to our simulation model, and we um, we tried to do simulations for different R processes. Some of you are probably familiar with the discussions that people think there may be more than one type of R process. So some people think there, were, there are three, some people think there are two, some people think there's more than that. All of it has different uh, parameters. So we wanted to eliminate those things. So it's the R process one or many, um, also, which mass models you use, and what's the impact of that. So trying to sort through all of this and come up with a set of the most critical nuclei to measure in the short term. So that's what we did. We did our simulation starting with the FRDM model, and I will show you some calculations for the different scenarios and also varying um, the masses. So, <coughs> yes? I got a question. Is there any initial conditions in your project simulations? I don't have the exact numbers, but I will show you some calculations, okay? okay. The initial <coughs> conditions in terms of seed or density or neutron number and so on, uh, I can show you, but I didn't want to clutter the transparencies okay. here. Okay. So, Um, the only purpose of this figure is um, to show that mass models vary tremendously as you go away from um, stability. What is shown here is a measured mass value difference from FRDM divided by the FRDM value. So um, you would expect this number to be zero if there was perfect agreement. Uh, the interesting thing with both these isotopes of tin and cadmium is that as you go away from stability, you have wide, wildly diverging predictions. So the mass models part is not straightforward and shows a lot of the uncertainty. Um, well, we thought this was important and timely because the uh, facility, the radioactive IMB facility in Japan is running, and Canada, France, Viral 2 is starting this year. GSI Fair and FRIB are all in progress. And meantime, at all of these facilities, it's going to be very difficult to get. So the most compelling case that you can make for the nuclei that are the most <coughs> important to measure, we think will win the day. So how are we going to determine these cases that are the most sensitive? We initially chose two approaches. So starting the simplest case, and this will answer your question in a little bit about uh, a specific R process number of conditions. So picking a model, not varying that. Use the FRDM predictions for masses for cases that are unknown. And then vary individual masses, <coughs> so individual separation energy by plus and minus 25%, um, and then look at the overall change in the abundances. So this is fairly tedious work, so you have to take each nucleus, vary separation energy for, the, for a pair of them, and run the simulation, and do that for every single one in all of this region, which is 
above z equals 50. And uh, initially we limited, but now we're going all the way to the actinides. So it's a big computational task in that sense. We did two approaches, one way of looking for the RMS change and a way of looking for the maximum change. In the end, we settled for the RMS, but I'll show you results for it. So this initial set of sensitivities is for z equals 28 to 50 using the two approaches. When I first looked at these results, we thought we're missing something. This is what you would have guessed before you had done the calculations. If someone told you which ones are the most important nuclei to measure, I should say the color intensity shows the biggest changes. Um, it looks like the nuclei at the closed shells are the ones that have the biggest impact generally, no matter what your approach. So there is a difference between the RMS way and the maximum change way in what happens in the middle. But basically, it's the nuclei you should measure are the ones in your closed shells. Um, I guess any nuclear physicist worth their salt would have guessed that in advance, but we didn't. <coughs> and then here are some calculations for two different R process scenarios. Um, one is for a called an H event, a high mass event. I would like you just visually to compare the fact that you have less abundances in the heavier region for some an R process that doesn't have the conditions to make the very heaviest nuclei. So the H gets you to the heavier cases, the L is in the lower cases. Both of these are done with an iron 70 C. So they both have very different R process conditions. But just in terms of comparison, you don't you don't get up there basically for this set of parameters. I thought, okay, it's very exciting that we can make a set of critical nuclei to measure, but if we vary the mass models, are we still going to get the same set of critical nuclei to measure? Um, these are running one R process uh, scenario, so both of them have the same condition but varying the mass models. Now this is done with duplo zucker this is done with ETFSI-12, and you can see again uh, differences in where the abundances go. So I'm only showing you a sample of the simulations. The basic idea is that no matter, uh, yes, I don't quite understand the talk. You're not showing the abundance there, are you? Because of your observability, right? I'm showing which nuclei you make, and the intensity is abundance. But these then they catch, right? Yes. Okay. It's just a snapshot of a minute, of one yeah. particular moment. Right? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, whatever calculations we made in these different kind of R process scenarios or different mass models, the same set of nuclei emerged. Uh, so we call these the critical set of nuclei to measure, um, and I'll show that in a minute, but I thought this might be instructive to uh, take a look for, for example, this is for cadmium-132, what the variations are um, between the model and the different variations, plus or minus 25%. It's only a visual comparison. There's no... Change if we one nuclei, you see the change in all the chain of the chain. Right. That's the... And of course, the ones we picked are the ones that are, came up to be the having the most impact. I didn't show you ones where there are no smaller impacts. So, so this is not a, yet a final list. We're working on it. But basically, uh, the same sets of nuclei emerge near closed shells. So the most compelling nucleus to measure next is probably nickel 80. Um, I'm on the Michigan State's uh, NSCL pack, and there were many proposals to measure this nucleus. None of them were approved because no one thought we could make them. So that's the status of the art of making these nuclei at the moment. Uh, but these are certain
currently the nuclei you want to measure. So the cadmiums are there, 134, 132, 138. You see that 138 and 136 are less impactful than some of the ones that are easier to measure. Uh, the indiums, uh, and so on. So we've developed a list like this for each of the R process uh, scenarios for the different mass models under all different conditions, limiting it between uh, T equals 28 to 50 because that's the region that is accessible now in the facilities um, around the world. That's where we are um, and we can do. So um, it looks like I whizzed through. <coughs> so, um, the process is uh, ongoing. We're almost done. But uh, we want to be sure everything is uh, the, way, the way it seems. And we're just using, so we did this for ourselves initially to guide what kind of proposals we're going to put in. And we ended up with this set of, I think, uh, critical nuclei that everyone in the nuclear science community can go out and measure. We'll have the most impact. So this way, going back to the R process problem of uh, making measuring the missing link or nuclear properties that can in turn limit the kinds of <coughs> astrophysical scenarios that could be presented as a possible site for the R process. So um, at least we're excited about it at the moment. We'll see where it takes us. I wanted to end by saying that this was the work of uh, two of my undergraduate <coughs> students. Sam Brett and Nancy Paul and uh, some of the other students doing the experiments that were that I talked about, the 